All right, we're seeing attendees trickling in. Hello, everybody. We'll get started in just a session while we wait. I'm gonna, you know, for a few more people to pop into the attendees, I see the, uh, the attendees numbers growing right now. Um, I'm gonna say this again in just a few minutes, but this is going to be a highly interactive session. So make sure you put your questions into the Q&A box while you wait for us to start and then upvote and downvote the ones you wanna hear the most from our amazing panel. And we'll just get started in one minute. Also put in the chat where you're from and where you're calling in from. Hi, Liam. <laughs> Make sure if you want to put something in the chat that you toggle the two from just the host and panelists to everyone so everyone can see. And I think we're uh, good to start. Everyone feel ready? Yeah. Austin in the house. France in the house. Bonjour. France. Atlanta. I see Atlanta. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is the first style of event that we're having of this kind. Welcome to Ask a CISO Anything, the no holds barred, you know, a question frenzy that we're going to have here today. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be very interactive. My name's Gianna Whitfer. I'm one of the co-founders of the Cybersecurity Marketing Society, along with my co-founder Maria here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So just a little bit about the Cybersecurity Marketing Society before we join. Uh, before we start. So the Cybersecurity Marketing Society is a community for cybersecurity marketers. We have over 1,000 members from cybersecurity companies who are marketers around the globe. We hit that number just two days ago um, and we're growing every day. We are a group and a network of cybersecurity marketers who are here to help us all market better, understand our audiences better, learn, grow, make connections, make professional networking connections, and just become better at being cybersecurity marketers. And we also have a lot of fun. We do a lot of programming. We partner with amazing organizations like the CISO Society, who I'll, who I'll cede the floor to in just one second. We also have a podcast uh, where we interview experts. So check out Breaking Through in Cybersecurity Marketing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you listen. And if you would like to join our private community of cybersecurity marketers, send us a, don't send us anything, actually visit a website cybersecuritymarketingsociety.com and there you can register and apply to join our group. So I am so excited that we are partnering today with the CISO Society. I'm going to let Jason explain, Jason Senamore over here, what the CISO Society does. Thank you very much, Gianna, and thank you very much, Service Security Marketing Society, for the opportunity to bring this session to you today. Um, so the CISO Society is essentially a private community of over 200 CISOs across North America, collaborating on everything from product implementation, leadership strategies, industry policies, talent, recruitment, retention. And one of our favorite topics is vendor reviews that the CISOs like to talk about amongst themselves. Um, that is managed by our organization, Lorem Advisory Group. Uh, so I'm the CEO of Lorem Advisory Group. And essentially what Lorem does is work with early stage and growth stage IT and security vendors to help them with customer, partner, strategic advisory boards, and then train vendors on the best way to reach your CISO or CIO audiences, make that message resonate and solicit the engagement. Awesome, great overview, Jason. And I wanna say also in full transparency, we are partnering with the CISO Society. So if you engage with the CISO Society later in this day or this week or this year, uh, make sure to tell them that you heard about uh, ha heard about the CISO Society from the Cybersecurity Marketing Society and help support the society and all the programming and things we do. We have a code, just type in the code SOCIETY when you sign up to talk to the CISO Society. Wow, I'm saying society a lot. Um, <laughs> so that is the partnership. Um, let's now talk about how to engage on this webinar because like I said, for those who joined early, this is going to be very interactive. This is about you and the questions you want answered. So we are going to first start off, a lot of you submitted when you signed up and registered for this event, you submitted questions. We're gonna start with a few of those, 
but we're not going to be able to hit all of those questions that were asked in the sign up process. So go ahead and in the Q&A box before and not the chat this time, please. Usually we say questions in the chat, but in the Q&A box, submit your question and then everybody vote on the questions you want answered. We have, you know, 55 minutes with our amazing CISO panelists. And we want to make sure that the, the questions that you want answered are answered. Um, and also what you can do is if you want to put your name, when you submit those questions, we will pull you up on stage to actually ask your questions directly. Yes, this is a game show <laughs> and we're going to pull you up and you can come and be in the spotlight and ask your questions directly to our amazing panelists. All right. So let's get started. First, I'm going to ask our panelists to please introduce themselves and give us an overview of who they are and what they do. Can I start with you, Iman? Certainly. Hi, everyone. My name is Iman Joshua. Uh, I am here broadcasting from lovely Cleveland, Ohio, and I am the head of security and IT shared services for a company called Vimeo. In my career, I've had a variety of CISO roles, uh, chief data security officer roles, chief privacy officer roles. So uh, I'm really excited to join you all for today's conversation. Awesome. We're so excited to hear your opinions on, on how we're doing marketing. <laughs> all right. Awab Arif, tell us a little about yourself and your role. Sure, Jana. Uh, so my name is Awab. I'm the CISO at East West Bank. I've been with the bank for about nine years now. Um, in my particular role, I am responsible for business continuity, disaster recovery, identity access management, uh, of course, information security, engineering and operations, and uh, IT risk management and compliance. Awesome. Thank you. And Larry, Larry Whiteside, tell us about yourself. Sure. So I'm um, Larry Whiteside Jr. I'm currently the Chief Security Officer of Women's Care. Uh, we're a national health care uh, entity. Um, I've got all physical and logical security responsibilities. I've been a CISO and CSO and CTO in startups and, and many other Fortune 1000 type companies. Um, I'm an advisor to probably some of the companies that are on here as I've been advising a number of different companies for a long time. I'm the CISO of the CISO Society as well. Uh, the CISO and resident. So I sort of help Jason govern our crew of, of people that we've got. And we've got an advisory board of, of uh, CISOs that help, helps me do that. And then the thing that I do that leads my passion on a daily basis is I'm also a co-founder and president of an organization called Cyversity that's geared at increasing diversity in the field of cybersecurity. So um, I've got my hands in a lot of things. Some people, they've been messaging me that I've known because I've been in this industry 29 years at this point. So um, I love doing this. I love running my mouth. And this is this is one of the things right from a marketing standpoint. I like helping organizations understand how to how to message, how to how to do those types of things. So I, I like having this conversation a lot. Well, thank you for being here, Larry. Thank you, Iman. Thank you, Awab. And thank you, Larry. And Bree Quinn said in the comments, yay, Cyberversity. So you have some fans. Um, all right, so let's get right into the, the pre-questions. And again, everybody vote on your questions that you want answered in Q&A. We're gonna go by upvotes in terms of what we're gonna actually ask the panelists after these questions, uh, after this suite of questions and um, submit your questions too. So we're gonna start off with something really juicy. What? is the worst thing a vendor has ever done? And I'm going to start with you, Iman. What do you think? Oh, boy. Uh, I will tell you that um, I have I have a couple of things that take points off from uh, vendors immediately. Uh, my name is Iman Joshua. I cannot tell you the number of vendors who have uh, referred to me as Josh and uh, suggested that I reach out to Josh about getting and get back to them uh, because they thought I was the admin. Uh, so do your research, know what, well, know what the first and last name is and uh, know what order it goes in and know whether, know to whom you're talking uh, because my picture is very readily available on LinkedIn. So that's a, it's a classic step one mistake. Uh, and, and often I, I actually will either respond I'll, I'll let Josh know, but that means that that, that person is probably never going to hear from me again. Um, 
the other thing that happens uh, that uh, I have a uh, over my career I have a lot of scar tissue, particularly in engaging with with vendors. So uh, the other worst possible thing that can happen is uh, is it's it's a little bit of uh, being super chummy, but providing absolutely no detail as to what the immediate value of the product is within the first 90 seconds. I have friends. I don't think that's the relationship I really need from, from my vendor. I, I need that to be a value add relationship, right? And so uh, while I'm always looking to expand my network, when I'm engaging with someone who wants to have a vendor relationship, it's very clearly a vendor relationship for me. And so um, uh, it's very important to have a really a really good understanding of the clear and present value that, uh, that that vendor can provide to me immediately, which means knowing that my company is, 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 a, is you know, a, a recording and, and video hosting company. And so having a long conversation about, uh, uh, about a different aspect of tooling that likely won't apply to us is not going to be a great value. So do your research, know who you're talking to, uh, and, and make sure that you present value in the first minute. That's a great point. No, no long conversations about how it's your tool is so good for financial services firms when Vimeo is, of course, a very famous media platform. All right. I'm also going to press record because I forgot to do that. <laughs> All right. A wob. What? I could have told my, my, I could have told my juicy story before the webinar was recorded. Rewind, <laughs> rewind. Maybe <laughs> next time. Maybe next maybe. time. Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to do another one. Okay. Oh, wow. What do you think? What's the worst thing vendors have done to you? What's a bad tactic that happens to you all the time? Um, so just like Iman, you know, I think the vendors need to do some research, right? Before they contact you. Um, you we get a lot of canned emails. Um, uh, the, the ones that really stand out to me where I don't want to even engage with that particular uh, vendor. And please take this as constructive criticism is that they will email you and say, hey, I met you at this conference and it was great meeting you. Uh, can we set up some time, right? So that would work if I actually went to that conference, right? But if I never went to that conference and I had just registered and due to some reason I couldn't make it, <laughs> that doesn't work. So they just purchased a list of emails, blasted everyone that it was nice meeting you. That, that just turns you off right away, right? Because you're not being honest. Um, another thing that, you know, marketing uh, emails like to do is they will try to instill some kind of a fear or sense of urgency that you need to get back. So they will email you and say, hey, based on our, you know, platform, we detected that one of your employee is, you know, uh, on this website and their credentials are there and, you know, all of your customers' information is there. Please contact us for more details, right? Usually it's nonsense, whatever they find, because it's also available to you on, you know, have I been pwned.com, right? So they're just basically trying to like, you know, start some kind of a conversation. And if you really have something that you care to let the organization know about, email me that information and say, hey, Awab, I just found this employee on this website and you know their credentials are compromised, right? And then, of course, that will build trust. And I might actually reach out to you and say, "Hey, how did you actually find this information?" Right? But don't try to like you know start a you know cliffhanger type of situation where you're expecting me to respond back. Um, so those are some of the things that like really you know turn you off about reaching out to vendors. I think doing research and being honest will get you a further than just, you know, blasting people. And in case of Iman, I've had that happen too also, right? With my last name being flipped with the first name. Um, and then you're like, okay, you didn't do the research to know that this is the first name and that is the last name. Great points. This is, a, yeah. this is for all marketers out there. And of course, salespeople too, because so for, it seems like for our community of people that we're trying to reach out to, sales gets mixed in with marketing. You know, it's still an extension of your brand. Right. And therefore, if your sales folks are doing things that even if you as marketers would not do, it's going to reflect poorly on the company brand. On the company, yeah. So I'm going to start, we're skipping Larry for now because he is um, 
Uh, double booked. Yeah, double booked. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, Awab, how about uh, the best marketing that's ever happened to you? Um, best marketing is like, you know, uh, for instance, I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, I do present at different events. Best marketing I've seen is, you know, in roundtable discussions, there is usually sponsors and things like that where they will come without mentioning a name of their company and just talk about a problem and a solution, right? And have an honest conversation. And at that point, you can say, okay, you know what? The, this person seems to know what's going on in the market. And then you start to engage with them. And I've had much better, you know, uh, relationships with, uh, you know, uh, vendors where that type of marketing was used. Uh, the email blasts, you know, they all go to this folder called junk. And I usually don't read them because like, you know, earlier mentioned, a lot of them are just not well researched and they're just blasting everyone. Is there anything that pulls your eye that from those email blasts that maybe you would want to respond to? Um, I'll go back to Iman's point, be concise, put three bullets in the email, what your solution does. You don't need to write, you know, a, a essay or a thesis, right? About what your solution does. Um, if you want to throw in a quick four to five minute video on what your solution does, that would work too, right? Um, because everyone is busy. Like, I, like you can see, Larry is double booked. He's doing this meeting. We all, like as CISOs, have back-to-back -back meetings or even overlapping meetings, right? We don't have time to read another five-minute, you know, six-minute uh, email from a vendor explaining their product. So I think being concise to the point, keep that four to five-minute attention span. And then, you know, if you can't deliver that message, then maybe your product is just too complicated. <laughs> Absolutely. Iman, what do you think? What's the best marketing that you've seen? Um, I have to be honest and say, uh, I really enjoy the, so I have to first be honest and say the, the, the most likely I am to engage and invest with a product uh, is, uh, is, if someone that I know that is a, uh, a trusted CISO has evaluated the tool. So uh, just like your friends may recommend a good restaurant to you, uh, we uh, professionals and practitioners recommend tools to each other. Um, from a marketing standpoint, I will also say the quality of detail and information I can glean from your website is highly informative to me. If your website itself uh, the materials on it are very slick, but I can't quite understand the exact value proposition that you're providing. I, uh, so, I mean, we all know these numbers, right? At this point, uh, people spend less than 30 seconds evaluating the quality and content of the initial website that they hit. So when I, when I'm looking at the information that I need to, uh, that I need to evaluate just to decide whether or not I'm even interested in researching the project, the product further. So I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, cold emails where, uh, where I have to kind of fish through and see whether or not I'm interested in the product. Now I'm talking about actually checking out the site. This is something that I may actually have interest in because I've, because I've, I've gone to, I've gone to your URL. If it's impossible for me to discern as someone that's visited the website, what, uh, what the value is uh, immediately. That's also very difficult. Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, I'm obviously biased towards video that that demonstrates immediate impact and results. Um, I'm I'm biased towards that because it's uh, it's highly informative and it's a small vignette of information that I can capture. The other the other thing that I would state is. Um, anytime I see a company that has gone through the effort of partnering with another organization to the level that they can either do a demonstrated uh, white paper, which means that they've gotten the true trust of another company, or they, uh, or they have a very unique uh, approach to a very standard problem, I'm going to be more interested in that uh, because as a strategy for an organization, you know, we have to decide which way we're going to go. Are we going to try to just rely heavily on tools like Gartner that say, okay, this is, this is where you are in the quadrant, or am I going to partner with some, with an organization that's more of a startup, more new, more adventurous. If, if I'm going to take that second strategy, I need to make sure and understand that the value is, uh, that the value is going to be returned to me 
uh, that investment very quickly. And so the fastest way that we can do that and my best experiences have always been um, the most informative, clear cut, tied directly to a specific um, a, a specific use case that can be expanded. Please don't tell me your platform can do everything. Everyone's platform can do everything. Please don't tell me single pane of glass, not one more, like if anyone else says it, I will I will jump out of this window. Like th those common, just just very boring um, conversations or tropes, they're not, they're not value add anymore. So it's it's being able to really talk about that specific situation that I'm trying to trying to address and then expanding beyond that to show me what else your tool is capable of. Iman, that's actually a really, really good point. Why don't we ask the panelists what are two buzzwords, marketing buzzwords that they hate to see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Iman, do you want to tell us? So we know you hate playing a glass. What else do you hate? Uh, please, please do not tell me that you have AI. Please, <gasps> please, please stop. You can tell me that you use machine language. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, machine learning. You can tell me that you've got an, M an ML capability. You can actually tell me whether or not you're using supervised or unsupervised learning and, and in what cases you're doing. So please do that, but do not just throw out AI there. It, AI has a very specific defined meaning that has a reliance upon a human interpretation. That's a that's a very specific use case, and it's not applicable to most uh, to most repetitive cybersecurity uh, environments. So understand that terminology. Be very crisp on it, and if anybody's using it, yank it out. Mm -hmm. yank it out. Okay, awesome. Oh, wow. What about you? What's a cyber marketing term you hate? Um, so I won't use the ones that Iman said. They they were spot on. You know. Um, the, the other thing that I've noticed is there are newer buzzwords every couple of months that come up, zero trust, right? Or, you know, uh, ZTNA or, you know, um, micro segmentation and s stuff like that where they're being used inappropriately where they don't belong, right? Um, uh, vendors are trying to basically stick them in to their product, even though that product does not have that as its base capability, just so they can get someone's attention because it says zero trust, right? Um, so I think like that that would be another one that you know I don't like. <laughs> I see in the chat next gen. That's another one. That's a, that's a, everything is next gen. <laughs> awesome. So everyone in the chat, put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. This is like the only time we ever ask. <laughs> um, and then also panelists, I just because we have such a, a huge amount of questions coming in, um, I might have to jump in and cut you off every once in a while. So please forgive us. Um, all right. So another question from our pre-call. Um, or from from uh, that a lot of people submitted in when they registered for this webinar. How do you buy security products? Can you be as specific as possible in this too? Like who's involved? Like how long is the typical research period? People want to know like the inner operations of the buying process. Like um, a while. I'll we'll start with you this time. Um, so the starting, of course, would be to actually find that technology, right? So if I have a problem that I'm trying to solve, um, I'm going to, of course, consult with the peer group that I have, right, uh, where I would check with them, hey, has anybody else solved this problem? And what have you used? What has your experience been? Uh, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So Jason is here, you know, uh, the CISO Society is one place that I can go and get that information. Um, I'm also a member of a mid-sized banking coalition group of America where, you know, CISOs from different banks are uh, part of that group. So that would be my first place where, you know, I would start my research. Google is always your friend. So you would, you know, so research to see what kind of products are out there that actually address that particular problem. Um, and that's where Iman's comment in regards to your website comes into play. If the information is too scattered on the website, I'm going to skip over and go to the next thing, right? So it has to be really precise and, you know, quick. Um, once I have selected, let's say, three or four different vendors, Gartner is another source, but I don't really rely as heavily on Gartner quadrants because, you know, uh, they're only talking about the big players that can afford to be on those uh, quadrants, right? The smaller guys don't have the capacity or the amount of money to be able to get on. So that's definitely Google search. Once I've selected a group, like three, five, you know, vendors that I would like to actually explore further, 
I'll actually reach out to them and, you know, try to set up a call. Um, or I'll engage with a value add reseller, right? Someone like Optiv and have them be the buffer so I don't get blasted with emails afterwards <laughs> from those vendors. So once I have now seen the product, I've seen a demo, done more of a technical deep dive, um, brought in my architects, you know, to see what the product looks like. Uh, at that point, we'll select maybe two to three vendors to actually do a POC with, right? So proof of concept is done. Once we have now decided which one, which particular vendor is the right fit for us, at that point, you know, the third-party risk management function comes into play where we have to establish a relationship. So, you know, setting up NDAs, setting up, you know, MSAs, uh, contracts need to be re reviewed and negotiated. After that comes the procurement part where, you know, I'll negotiate the pricing part, <laughs> right? My third-party risk management team will negotiate the pricing. And once we all feel comfortable with the numbers, that gets processed and, you know, that's basically the end of the entire engagement. So hopefully it was detailed enough, Gianna. Uh, that was very detailed. That okay. was great. <laughs> One quick question before we bump that question to Iman. Um, are you actually, so are, Awab, are you actually doing the research on, on the vendors that solve the pain point or do you, does your, do you have analysts that help you or is it seriously like you doing the Google search, the initial search? So uh, of course, for each individual, it would be different. Uh, I'm a little bit more hands-on. My background is pretty technical. So, you know, I jump in the deep end of the pool. Um, but in some cases where the CISOs might be coming from a risk management background or internal audit background, they may rely more on their architects and engineers to do that research, right? Um, the initial research, bring that information back to them, and then they can say, okay, uh, let's go to that POC state, right? And of course, they will be part of the demo and everything else. So Awesome. Iman, how are you buying and your team buying cybersecurity products? Excellent question. So uh, for my team on a quarterly basis, we come up with our problem set. It is uh, associated with our risk management um, function tied to the type of risks we've identified in the threat landscape and in our environment over the past quarter, and that's aggregated. Once we identify what our, uh, what our problem set is, we start to identify whether or not we want to build it in-house or if we want to find an external vendor to do so. Uh, I, I differ a little bit. Uh, I differ a little bit from my counterpart in that uh, I believe that I want to put the best tool I, I possibly can uh, with the people that enjoy working with the tool. I may like a tool, but if my team hates it, I'm not going to purchase it, right? So um, I start with uh, I start with a team of analysts and engineer, engineers. We identify the people who will most likely be using the tool on a day-to-day -to -day basis, and they are the people that help us do our research and and uh, proof of value. So in that in that vein. Uh, I often find that uh, that sales and marketers uh, misunderstand the value of impressing me on a call. It actually doesn't have a lot of value uh, for 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 me because uh, if you if you rely on impressing me, but then you fail to to notice the engineers that I've intentionally brought on the call and and make sure that you engage them properly, you're actually going to miss out on a, on a large uh, subset. They're the ones that had the highest level of influence as a result. Um, it also it also means that I don't have to worry as much about the the types of marketing emails and items coming in because by the time we get to our three or four, it's been researched by multiple people on the team because we're using every stakeholder that will be, uh, that will not only use it, maybe some tools have, you know, an end user, and then we have some user that, the, some, some that has customers or stakeholder output from, the, from those uh, tools. Um, and so we approach it that way. The entire timeline of, you know, getting, getting past that first hurdle to engagement, after that, you know, the whole procurement process, I won't even touch on that, but I can't uh, reinforce enough the, the, the value of using, of, of crowdsourcing. So yes, I will, you know, look on, on the CISO Society Network to see if there are other tools. I'll reach out to my peers, but I also have 
my team reach out to their peers? Let's crowdsource and see what the best likely subset of tools is. And from that, we do pick our top three. I uh, don't know a lot of places that have the time or availability to do proof of value on more than three tools at a time. And that time frame is also incredibly protracted. I will not assess anything longer than uh, four to five weeks. Uh, if you have improved your value in ease of installation or implementation, um, uh oh, am I frozen? No, you're good. Okay, ease of uh, implementation or installation, as well as immediate reporting and return on investment in those first four weeks, it's doubtful that you'll be able to do so after that point. And uh, we are also doing all of that negotiation at the in the same time frame to cut down that uh, that acquisition time frame. So by the time you see me, you've basically got two weeks to to wet ink. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's great. That's a thank you for that explanation, Iman. That was really, really helpful, and also it emphasizes the importance of the buying team. Of course, you're not just selling to the CISO and the head of security. You know, no offense to all our panelists. You know, we're selling also a lot of the times to the team who's going to actually use the tool. Um, Larry, so um, quick. Uh, as detailed as you can, but also as quick as you can, because we have so yeah. many questions coming in. So, so I'm, and, and I'm not going to get real detailed in the mind. So I'm going to mm -hmm. do this. I'm, I'm going to make it better. So I, I think you heard two similar but very different perspectives on how this, this has happened. So a way for marketers to understand likely which direction the organization and the CISO that they're going with is going to go is going to be based on a couple of things. Size of the organization. Right. Those CISOs with larger teams are going to do it the way Mon spoke about because they have the ability to delegate and they have the people to do that with. People with smaller teams don't have that ability to delegate to people. Right. Right. But then also understanding, right, who the CISO is. Right. So um, a buddy of mine and I came up with these personas. You need to understand the persona of the CISO. Is your CISO a, a tech geek? Are they a technologist? Do they speak about tech things? Have you looked at the type of things they comment on and they say? If you know that they're technologists and they're likely going to be heavily engaged in these types of conversations because they're a geek by nature, right? If you don't see them engaging in those types of things, then it's likely they're delegating a lot of that. So it's it, this is an important hearing the dichotomies of both of them of how they operate this of understanding the organization you're dealing with, the potential size of that CISO's team, and whether they have the ability to delegate that, right? And where they're going to be, and then where that CISO's persona sits, right? Mm -hmm. To because to a Wob's point, if they come from a governance and risk background, they're probably not going to be deep steep in having technology conversations, right? So it, it's very very important to do. To Iman's point, just a couple of minutes worth of homework that's openly available on Google and LinkedIn, right? If you go look at a per person's LinkedIn profile and just look at their profile and look at the things that they've commented on over the last month, their top five mm -hmm. to 10 things, you will quickly get a picture of who they are. Exactly. And you can even see their backgrounds too, where they grew up from, were they an engineer or was it more right. governance and, and risk and things? Exactly. So that's amazing insight, Larry. So one more fast, super quick question. Maria, do you want to start looking at the questions in the in the Q&A? And I have one more question for the panelists. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I have my most upvoted. There's some okay, really, cool. really cool ones in there. Let's so, get into it. Super fast before we go there. What events are you attending this year? People want to know. And if, we, if you just want to say the names, that would be sufficient. Larry, what are you attending this year in terms of security events? So honestly, it's it's the same big ones, right? It's, it's RSA, uh, maybe Black Hat, and then Cyversity. We're having our our conference this year in November, right? But um, it's really the big ones. Okay. For me. Oh, wow. What are you attending this year? Woo. RSA, Black Hat, DEF CON, Splug.com. Those would be, you know, the must go. The rest. Uh, like Larry said, there are a lot of good big ones that happen. So as time permits. Okay, cool. And then Iman, I saw you shaking your head. What events? She's not going anywhere. I'm not. I'm not. I am. Uh, I am not your conference goer unless I'm speaking. So I'm not going to go. Uh, I will attend. Uh, 
if I do anything, I come in for the, the round tables and then I go back out. So okay. I'm there not, you go. I'm, that's that's yeah. one aspect of the persona, right? Of the Iman right. persona. <laughs> but Iman, let me, is your let me team add to this. attending any event? Sorry, Larry, hold on one sec. Is your team no, no, attending yeah. any event? Yes. Okay. So they'll still be out there. So, so, and- so let me add something. So it's it's also important to know when you meet CISOs and are talking to CISOs about events that they're going to, many CISOs aren't going to the events for the events. Most CISOs go to the event because that's the only time that they get to see their peer group that lives all across the globe during the year. So they tend to go to these, these things just so that they can collaborate in person and, and break bread with their peer group in person. That is the primary. We typically have our teams go to the events, right? Uh, Because we want them to attend the sessions and we want them to bring back the knowledge associated with what they're getting at the sessions. And a a parallel to that is CMOs go to network at events and then us, the rest of the team goes to learn stuff. So Maria, let's go into our questions. I see highly upvoted questions. Everybody put your questions in the Q&A and upvote and downvote the ones you want answered. All right, yeah, let's jump right in. Uh, This one has 19 votes, which is insane, but I agree that it is a pretty hot question. So uh, our panelists, where do you like to consume content? What is your preferred content uh, to consume? Two part question. Uh, And Iman, we'll start with you. Uh, I guess I, I feel like that needs a little bit more qualification. Are we talking about consume content in terms of looking for a new product? Because it really, it really depends. I think they mean media. So like what media and news outlets do you go to for the latest cyber news, if you will? Yeah. What's your trusted media source? Twitter. I mean, are we are we not are we are we are we being honest here? Uh, yeah, Twitter, absolutely. Reddit and Discord is where I'm I'm finding most of my information, but of course that's obviously uh, very uh, nascent and in, in particular and unique to to looking at threat intelligence. That's not where I'm looking for products. Um, I'm, I'm not looking at Twitter for product recommendations. Um, there are a variety of 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 security blogs with, by by very you know, large companies, Mandian, et cetera, you know, FireEye, all of that, you know, that, 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 that uh, I follow and, and read content from there. I am, I am the, the, the uh, security lead who looks at, um, who does read white papers and, and looks and, and research journals. Cause I think that those uh, are really interesting in terms of uh, academic and, and, and practitioner research. I think that that's fantastic, but um from a marketing content, I don't think that that those those initial areas apply. Okay, that's a really good answer. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Awab? Where where do you go? Yeah, so to Iman's point, if it's threat intel, it's going to be a different source, right? Um, but if it is about products and services, it's a different source. So um, I'll try to answer both of them very quickly. Um, if it's threat intel, then I'm going to FBI. CISA, US CERT, right? These are my sources for any vulnerabilities, any new, you know, hacks or breaches or whatever have you. I'm kind of consuming that information from there. In terms of products and services, there are a lot of firms uh, and I'm kind of bummed that, you know, in 2019, NSS Labs basically just shut their door. That was a good source of information for me. They would test vendor products, classify it into different categories. And they were testing it from a technical perspective, whereas Gartner Quadrant, of course, is another good source to go to. Um, but they're also incorporating business side and you know financials and things like that. Um, and technical is a component of the ratings that they're giving. Um, other sources, of course, would be you know the societies and groups we are part of. And to Larry's point, those events that I go to, those are networking events. That's where you're actually meeting people talking about different problems, different solutions, and learning about products. So that's another source that I use for, you know, keeping myself up to speed and up to date. Love that. As we speak, a lot of marketers are changing their strategy and channels now. <laughs> <laughs> one, one recommendation though I would make is, you know, um, groups like the CISO Society, right? Uh, Jason and I am part of the advisory board. We talk about these things that how would we 
get you know a list of vendors put together right where we can learn about the product without really having to even engage with the team right so maybe the marketing strategy is to reach out to these groups like the CISO society and others and and try to engage with them and say hey you know if you guys don't have a list we can provide you a list with all this stuff right and i think that would be helpful for the CISOs to go to and start their quick research about products and services yeah all about community. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Larry? Yeah. So for me, it's, it's a combination of that, but it's also my peer group, right? So I'm in nine different Slack channels. I'm in 12 different text groups via signal, right? Uh, multiple WhatsApp groups with, you know, with CISOs and, and, you know, other security people from around the globe. So it's really a combination of all of those things, right? Combined together. And so, because I recognize I'm never going to be the single source. I, I can never read enough. I can never find enough, you know, time to go through all the links and through all the things. So it's a combination of the things they both mentioned, but it's also this peer group and other people that sort of collaborate with us, right? And so it's everywhere. There's no right or wrong answer to where you get your information from as long as you have a place that you're getting some information from right and that and that that info it's not a single source that you have a sort of a globe distributed network of ways that information flows into you so like i'll talk the late that vulnerability that the zero day that came out with the next shell right right i got literally that via 10 different channels all within 20 minutes of each other Right. Without me having to go search and say, oh, wow, a new, a new zero day came out. Huh, I didn't even know. No. Right. So it's important to really have a networked approach to information gathering. Right. And just don't have a single source. Love that. Um, I think we answered a bunch of questions in just one uh, answer of one question. So I'm going to skip over. But I like this one, actually. What which analyst forums analysts do you follow and why? And I know I think Imani or somebody might have answered a little bit of that earlier, but let's let's go into more detail. Uh, we'll start with you, Awab, this time. Yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, NSS Labs was one place that I used to use. Um, uh, there is also Gartner, of course. Um, for you know different types of platforms, there are different sources. So like if you're looking for endpoint security, for example, there is AV test, you know, uh, platform that actually tests the product to give you, you know, a little bit of a heads up start on your research. So those would be some of the sources I would mention. Got it. Uh, and Iman, um, preferred analysts, group analysts. Uh, there, there are, there are a bunch. I mean, I. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that one of my most fun ways of doing uh, additional research is to dive into the comments uh, of articles posted in Bleeping Computer and then just fish my way out from there. It's a fantastic way to see new people that are entering into the space as well as some well, uh, well-known well friends of mine that uh, comment under different identities. It's a lot of fun. I rely... Uh, I, I do rely very heavily on, you know, some of the blogs and that I've already mentioned. Um, you know, uh, I, I, at this point, uh, my 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 aggregate of of different sources is somewhere around nineteen or twenty. Uh, and what I would say is, for the purposes of today's conversation. Um, because part of because I recognize that the objective is to say like how can we get your attention, it's not just getting the tools in front of those groups. It's not that's that's not necessarily the value because sometimes when I'm looking um, when I'm looking at articles, I'm actually articles or comments or research. I'm looking at tools, not tools, but techniques that they're doing um, that that may be interesting. Or, or or new, and so the tool itself is uh, often not the not the driver in that case. So for the purposes of today's conversation, um, I would say that uh, the way to catch my attention, because it feels like that's one of those questions that's that's in this list, and part of why people are asking the question, right, is is uh, truly uh, getting your getting your product in the hands of of other 
companies that are similar in size or intention. And that's that's when it's interesting to me, when you've actually solved the problem for a company. So I hate to say it that way because it's like, okay, how do I get your business if I don't or if I don't already have business? How can I get you to be the first one? But it it truly is. It it, yeah. it becomes it, it becomes a word of mouth. Yeah. Social proof. That's why that's why those customer case studies are gold for us marketers. Um, so that's awesome. So let's make the switch real quick to a different channel now. And I see a few questions around email marketing. Um, and so a few people have asked about email, email and email marketing differently, but how could we do email marketing better as cybersecurity vendors? And would you click on links or attachments and things like that, that you would receive in emails? <laughs> uh, Larry, let's start with you. Not clicking on links and attachments, it's not happening, right? So like that that's a thing of the past with phishing being the number one mechanism for compromise today, that's just, right? So, um, so email marketing, so number one, blasts don't work. To be very clear and transparent, blasts do not work. I've, I, and I'm one who tends to respond to blasts to try and give someone a little bit of a lesson like, hey, Next time, take a couple of minutes and right, do a, just a little bit of research, right? So, so blasts don't work, number one. Number two, books don't work. You cannot write a book if you have not gotten my attention within the first two sentences as a wrap. I'm done. I, we get, uh, how many are averaging over 500 email a day, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, so, even us as marketers, we get we get plenty as well. Of right. Course. So if you really want us to see something, the subject has to matter. And then you got to capture our attention on why the subject is a should be a thing for us. Period, point blank, within the first two or three sentences. If you can't do that, it's not even it's not because to be clear, all of us are using the preview screen. And so it'll go unread. Or we'll just mark it, mark, put it as a group and mark as red without even reading it if you have not captured us as part of the preview screen. It's not even going to get open past that. Subject line, the best real estate in your email marketing. <laughs> Anyone else want to add uh, to that, Iman? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm so passionate. Please don't send me an attachment. Please don't send me an attachment. Please don't send me an attachment. Uh, please do not send me an attachment. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the fastest okay. way to get your, your whole domain locked. That's the, the fastest way. Boom. Uh, what I will say, though, is um, only two vendors in the past 18 months have successfully gotten feedback from me via email. The first one uh, sent me an email that had a subject line that said, uh, per our conversation yesterday. And it was, I was groggy and I thought that I had spoken to somebody yesterday. And then I, as I read the email, I realized that they did that. And I said, uh, I did respond to them that I, that was the worst um, introduction email that they could possibly have sent. And it did not matter the value of their product. They would not be hearing from me in, in the immediate future. And I hope that they don't do this to other people because uh, if, if anybody's been through any sort of recent security incident where you are bleary eyed and not quite focusing, inadvertently um, responding to one of those emails that sounds uh, uh, ever, ever so slightly urgent, even though uh, the email had an external tag on it, you know, it, it was just, it was very disconcerting to me. So that's, that, that was a bad case. The good case though, is um, that that vendor had a really great subject and they had clearly, as I started out the conversation, researched, you know, that, that my company had recently gone public and that we had recently done an acquisition and, and the, the email was targeted and it said, Hey, if you've done an acquisition recently, these are some things that you might want to think about. Uh, and this is how my tool can solve the problem. I read that email and it actually ended up being a fantastic vendor and we onboarded them about two and a half months later. So that is an example of a successful engagement. And that's the type of targeted communication that would work for me. But, the, but if, you're, if you're in any participation of the first kind, know that by and large, uh, it's not gonna be well received. Yeah. So no, no tricking through a subject line and no attachments, guys. Come on. This is like catfishing. You know, this is like no direct calendar invites. Let me tell you, if you send a direct calendar invite, it's a wrap. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Happens? Let's get in, let's get into that for a quick uh, sixty it's, seconds. You yeah no it it happens it's it's happened for years and even though we've talked about it at RSA on panels we've talked about it via podcasts it still happens. If you ever send the direct calendar invite, every CISO I know on the planet is never ever going to meet with you. Period. Point blank. Yep. Yeah. Straight block on that particular email address. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 that, that's unacceptable. And like, you know, just to kind of chime in on what Larry and uh, Iman were saying in regards to email, emails, glass, like Larry was saying, do not work at all, right? So stop doing that. Instead, try to like, you know, uh, do some research and send a direct email with, like Larry was saying, with very precise information. Now, the thing that I would defer on a little bit with my peers here is first email, do not put any attachments because that's just going to get ignored. If I've already established a you know, line of communication with you, then I'll expect some attachments, white papers. Whatever. I agree with that. Yes, yes. The, that. the initial email could include a link, but it has to be to a prominent site. That four or five minute video clip that I was talking about, if it's Vimeo, YouTube, I'll click it, right? But if it's like, you know, going to a Dropbox or a box, that's not happening. I'm not going to click on that link, right? So if you're posting your demo video on YouTube and that's the link you're embedding into the email and in the initial email, I'll click it. I'll watch that four to five minute video. If those three, four bullets, that two line, you know, introduction clicks with me, right? So uh, that, that's what I would say in regards to emails, but I would prefer that emails was not uh, a line of communication anymore. And we use some other better ways to communicate. But unfortunately, we haven't reached that, you know, state of communication yet. Yeah, we're, we're getting this. Is, this is why we have this forum. We're going to do many more of these. Don't worry. We're, right. we're making the change. So on, on the same topic of outreach, and Gianna, we'll do a pulse right after this for a time. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour. And I knew this was going to be a crazy, exciting conversation. We're definitely not going to end the time. Um, but uh, in terms of like sales outreach or um, that first meeting with the, with the sales team, how technical would you prefer that first conversation be or not? Um, yeah. Okay. Ima, let's, let's get right into it. I wasn't raising my hand. Oh, okay. I was the answer if this is the if this is the high technical air please start please start here don't don't start don't start down here i i, I think that um i will i i will agree with Wab that uh, earlier statement that there are you know there's different types of CISOs, but it's actually very hard to survive in this industry if you don't have technical competency yeah so Every CISO you meet has technical competency. You should defer to that assumption at the start. Um, period. Doesn't matter if they. Uh, it doesn't matter if they, you know, started out uh, working in labs or they started out with a risk competency. You can't survive in this field for more than a couple of years, maybe one year, without true technical competency. So you should start here. Start at the top. And if you need to lower the conversation, I think that I think that people are people are pretty obvious and transparent. You can you can gauge that over time, but give everyone the 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 deference of respect in in believing that they uh, you know that they've got some technical chops. Start there, and if you need to explain some 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 concepts or technologies to them, then you can take that opportunity to do so. Got it. Got it. And I saw some uh, nodding heads between Awab and Larry. So I think there's consensus consensus there. Um, what about cold call? Yes or no? Quick answer. Awab. <laughs> I don't answer no. an office phone. No. If no. the if the number is not in my contacts list, it's going straight to voicemail. Got it. Larry, yeah. that was a no for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and to be clear. <laughs> oh, I love that. I might have to make that sign up. So here's the deal. My, my cell phone is very widely known because I've been in this industry a long time. And I've had this cell phone number since 2003 or something, right? If we've never talked, don't call me on my cell phone. Don't do it. Just because it's in my signature block does not mean I give you the authority to call my cell phone. My cell phone literally will send it to voicemail immediately if it's not a number that I recognize it's not in my contact. 
It's, it's going to voicemail. And so, then if I hear it and I know it's you, it's a wrap. So quick question just on that line, because this is also something that a lot of people want to know. What about LinkedIn and LinkedIn messages? Are you ever receptive to having a conversation with a vendor with the LinkedIn first reach? Out, out touch because you know people we hate emails we hate uh cold calls what is there a way to talk do you talk to people on linkedin ever or do you accept Again, that yeah it's not that we hate email no, it's I know. we hate blast right right so but the same thing same thing applies on linkedin don't blast me do not send me something right so okay i told you all about diversity right it's a not-for-profit geared at increasing diversity why are you sending me a message saying hey uh, we see you, you're the president of diversity. Uh, we can help you with your cyber issues. What cyber issues? Right? Like, what are you talking okay. about? <laughs> right? But it's because they're doing blast. No. Yeah. So, yes, a targeted, I, I have targeted conversations on LinkedIn all the time from people sending me messages that are very yeah. specific. You have to. I'm a very public person, as are uh, my two colleagues here, right? We post on LinkedIn, we comment. You can mm -hmm. see things that we discuss and participate in conversation about. Take a two second time out of your day and just look at that, right? And and utilize something that you've gleaned from that to have a direct conversation related to something that's important to us. Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. not hard. Awab, what do you think? Do you, take, do you ever have a conversation with uh, someone, a vendor on LinkedIn? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, sorry, my Zoom just restarted. Yeah. So I was. Yeah, me too. Uh, was weird. Oh, really? Okay. That's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, I agree with Larry. The same email rules that we talked about earlier would apply to LinkedIn communication, right? Do your research. Two minutes, two sentences. That's it, right? And if I don't respond, don't keep blasting me. I read your message. I'm not interested. <laughs> Makes sense. Iman, Iman, what do you think? Do you ever accept, accept a LinkedIn request or a message from a vendor? Has that ever resulted in a POC or anything? Uh, yes, it has. However, I was a, I was younging in the game at that time. Uh, <laughs> is that is that a nice way to say it? I was I was new. You are to my new game. best friend. I'm just I was a young into the game, and I, I felt I, I felt loved and popular uh, when that happened. Now, as uh, as 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 an OG, maybe a, a mid G, maybe a mid G. Uh, I definitely, yeah, it's it's much less likely. And I wanna I wanna just touch on this question real quick because I know we're almost out of time. So I I wanna I wanna say this. Uh, I understand that all of you have a job to do, and your job is to put the right tool in the hands of the business that can use it to the best of its ability. And it's very challenging because you're dealing with people who may be uh, apparently a little curmudgeonly and also, uh, you know, uh, are short on time and also, you know, in, in some cases, very difficult to please. So if you're looking for uh, to reach out to those people, we are telling you to do so and try to create, uh, try to create and cultivate one-on-one -on -one relationships. And the type of event uh, a person like me is likely to attend is going to be um, uh, like something that's going to be around 90 minutes no longer than two hours. It's going to have a short period of introduction to the tooling, and then it's going to allow for good conversation to, to originate. So it's not, I'm not going to say I will only come to a dinner. I'll only come to a networking. That's not true. I will come to a variety of experiences, but if you're trying to craft something intentionally, recognize it's got to be a short one. It should be an, an intimate engagement. It should be a direct conversation, and then it should allow for or organic growth uh, beyond that. So please, I would love if, if these companies, if your companies started bringing your technical engineers to the networking events. Why are they not there? Why oh, are they bring them? Ridiculous. They like to come out of the basement too, just as much as I do. Come <laughs> on, please bring them to the events. Let's have that conversation because they may, I may have that side conversation uh, uh, with them during the event about the questions that I might've asked during the demo. And that's gonna create another type of relationship, so.
That's great. We need to plug the society and the CISO Society right now again. So thank you so much because we're at 12.59 p.m. Eastern. So thank you so much, Iman, Iwab, Larry. This has been, and Jason also, um, who looked very beautiful sitting there. Um, <laughs> um, this has been a really invigorating, fun, exciting conversation. All of you, we're going to invite you to be on our podcast where we can get really juicy because we yeah. have to do that. This was insane. Um, this was this so was good. And so I want to tell everyone who's listening, the join the cybersecurity market. Oh, poll, put a poll up, Maria. Oh my gosh, I forgot. We have oh. a poll. If you'd like to learn more about the workshops that the CISO Society is doing that connect CISOs with vendors for advising and consulting and feedback on their marketing, I'm watching the poll right now. Please say if you're interested in this poll or use the code society when you contact the CISO society. And it actually, it helps support the group, the Cybersecurity Marketing Society, as you all know, who are listening. Um, we have a lot of members in, uh, in attendance and we do a lot of things like this to help the greater cybersecurity marketing community. So if you work with the CISO society, it also benefits the Cybersecurity Marketing Society. So <laughs> uh, any closing words from our panelists? Anything else you wanna say? Nope. <laughs> no, I think we shared a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, and it was good uh, conversation. I think if we could take some of this information back and the way, you know, uh, products and services are communicated with us, that would be a mutual benefit on both sides. Awesome. Yeah, and I, and I want to I add a bit of clarity about LinkedIn. So when I talked about engagement on LinkedIn, don't send me a random invite. I don't know you. I'm not accepting it, to be clear. I've actually had to change it because I was getting 50 a day. I had to change it to where you have to know my email address. A conversation via Messenger, via uh, the LinkedIn Messenger, yes, I will have a direct targeted conversation, but it's not until we've had a number of conversations that I will accept an invite from you. So don't send me a random invite. Love that. Can I add you now, Larry, now that we kind of- Now you can, <laughs> yes. We've, been, we've engaged now. All right. Thank you all so much. We appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to leave this open just for people to finish okay. answering, filling out the poll. We're still live. So everybody, because there's still 21 people on, fill out that poll, please. And we'll see you at another event. And join the Cybersecurity Marketing Society if you're not already a member. We are the largest group of cybersecurity marketers in the world. And we have fun and we do things like this. And we're going to have a conference this yeah. year too in person. And you're going to want to be there. Oh, yeah, look, over a thousand strong. That's right, Melody. That's <laughs> right. Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, this will be recorded and sent out afterwards. Yeah, Thanks, it's on our YouTube channel already. You can check it out. It is. We're live streams. Yeah. Look at us. We're so, uh, we're yeah. so technologically awesome savvy. Marketers. We're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we do have to actually drop the last 12 people. I hope you filled out the poll and also check out our podcast and yeah. See you soon.